morning I speak to you on the subject, the fourth beatitude, or what are the three kinds of righteousness. The scriptures are printed in your bulletin, so let's stand together in honor of God's Word. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Thank you. Be seated, please. righteousness spoken of and they are number one imputed righteousness and salvation righteousness then there's ethical righteousness that is doing right in life and deed that's the daily life thirdly there is personal righteousness and that is knowing who our righteousness is in this sermon that Jesus preached on the mountaintop, it sets forth the attitudes and the character of those whom God has brought into His kingdom. There are four subjects in verse 6. First, the subject of blessedness. He said, blessed are they. Then secondly, there's the subject of hunger and thirst. Thirdly, the subject of righteousness. And fourthly, the subject of filling. Now, these Beatitudes exist in all true believers. Faintly in some, and predominantly in others. Righteousness is received by regeneration. It is practiced in sanctification. Let's take the first one. The imputed righteousness which is received in regeneration. In Romans 4 and verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. In Isaiah 61 and verse 10, it is likened unto a garment. For I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. In Zechariah 3, we read in verse 3 and 4 of Joshua. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of 
ray of it. We see that it's a garment of salvation. It is inward. It is possessed by all who are born again. In Philippians chapter 3 and beginning with verse 7, Paul wrote to the Philippian church and he reviewed all the things that counted most to a Jew. And then he said in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb or refuse, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. By faith. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. And then Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus. He wanted them to experience that knowledge of Christ that he had. So he wrote to them and said in Ephesians that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend, to apprehend, to understand with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That was his prayer for the Ephesian saints. And that righteousness is salvation righteousness. That's the only way one can have it, is to receive it by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we come to the second part, which is righteousness in sanctification. Righteousness practiced in sanctification. That is, the saint of God lives a righteous life before the world. This is the second righteousness. It is ethical. It is practical. It can be seen in the lives of his people. James probably got closer to it than anyone else. If you read the book of James, you'll find that he extols and proclaims practical righteousness in the daily life. In James 1.22, he said, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. In other words, if you do not have practical righteousness in your life, you're only deceiving yourself. You don't deceive anyone else. Chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not, those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? It doesn't do a hungry man any good to pat him on the head and say, well, bless you, brother, and not give him a coin so he can get a loaf of bread. That is 
hypocritical religion. That's not the religion James is talking about. Doing right. Helping others. Being compassionate toward those that are less fortunate than you. It is shoe leather salvation. Doing right. It's the joy of practical life. I read one time about a man walking down the street. He met a little boy standing outside the grocery store. The little boy was sobbing and crying. And he went over to him, he was a Christian, and he said to the little boy, Son, what's the matter? Why are you crying? The little boy said, Well, sir, my father gave me 50 cents to go buy a loaf of bread. And I lost the 50 cents. I can't find it. And I can't go home because he will beat me. And the man said to him, Son, here's the money. Go buy the bread and take it on home. And the little boy thanked him. And then he looked up at the man and said, Mister, I sure wish you were my daddy. And the man said, you know what I did the rest of the afternoon? He said, I walked all over town looking for another little boy that I could give some money to. That's practical righteousness. How is righteousness received? This practical righteousness. By hungering and thirsting. That's our text today. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. It means to have an intense desire, a passionate longing, an insatiable craving for a righteous, practical Christian life. Hunger is a sign of life. When a man is dead, he's no longer hungry. And every Christian needs to be hungry for practical righteousness in his life. And if he's not saved, he needs to be hungered for salvation righteousness, which comes by faith. David, the great king of Israel taught us what it meant to be hungry and thirsty. In Psalm 63, he said, O oh God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. In Psalm 84, and verse 2, he said, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out, for the living God. Then again, he reiterated that desire in Psalm 42 and verse 1 and 2 as he expressed the deep heart hunger of his desire for a closer walk with the Lord. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? But today, there seems to be no hunger or thirst after God. Nobody's interested in the Bible. 
Nobody's interested in knowing God. There's no hunger today. No deep-seated longing to know the living God. The Scottish preacher, Thomas Guthrie, one of the old Puritans, wrote this in the last century, back in 1660. He said, If you find yourself loving any pleasure better than your prayers, or any book better than the Bible, or any house better than the house of God, or any table better than the Lord's table, or any person better than Christ, or any indulgence better than the hope of heaven, take alarm. Now there are things that spoil a spiritual appetite for the living God. I remember years ago, I came home from work and I was really hungry. I had a breakfast of only a cup of coffee, a very light lunch. Now it was dinner time and I was hungry. I went in and said to my wife, is dinner about ready? I'm hungry. She said, in a little bit. And I sat down in my chair and picked up the newspaper and I glanced over on the table at my side and there was a box of chocolates. And I called in to her and I said, is dinner about ready? I am really hungry. She said, in a few minutes. And I looked at those chocolates and I reached over and I took one. And then I reached over and I took another one. Oh, they tasted so good. And I got another one and another one and another one. And in a few months, she called, said, come to the table, Jack, it's ready. I said, I'm not hungry. The chocolates had taken away my appetite. And the devil has chocolates galore to offer God's people. Anything you want, he will give you to keep you away from the Bible. When you have a little hunger for a knowledge of Jesus, if he sees that, He'll come with a box of chocolates and He'll take away your appetite by offering you things that you just thought you had to have. You didn't have time to read the Bible. You didn't have time to pray because there was a box of chocolates. He's offering it to you to keep you away from the Word of God. Beware of those chocolates. Then the second thing that keeps people from having a hunger is that they're just so busy. They just don't really have time to read the Bible. There's an Old Testament story of a man who had been put in charge of a prisoner. And he said, you keep your eye on him and don't let him escape. Because if you do, you'll forfeit your own life. And the king came back and he said, Where is your prisoner? And he said, As I was busy here and there, he was gone. I was busy doing something else and he slipped away from me. And he said, Thou wicked servant, Thou knewest that thou wouldst have to pay the supreme penalty if your prisoner escaped. We let the Word of God escape from us because we get busy here and there with this and that. 
James Brooks, a famous preacher, had his little daughter sitting by his side on Saturday night. He was preparing his message for Sunday morning. And she was busy doing this and that. And pretty soon he said, Can't you be a little more quiet? What are you doing? And she said, Well, Grandpa, I just wanted to be with you. And that's all God wants from you. He just wants to be with you. Do you have time for Him to be with you? Then there's the story of Huey Long. He was a senator from Louisiana. He was in charge of the distribution of steel to different companies. And with his henchmen, he walked out of his office one day and down the hall And he was accosted by a dentist. And the dentist said to him, Mr. Long, I would just like to have five minutes of your time. If you'll just give me five minutes of your time, that's all I need. And Huey Long said, I wouldn't give Jesus Christ five minutes of my time. I am too busy. And he walked around the corner and he was shot dead by a man that he had offended. I wouldn't give Jesus Christ five minutes of my time. And as he stepped around the corner, it took his life. We better take time for the Word of God and for Jesus. I remember so distinctly around the corner from our house down a couple houses there was a nice house but something had happened to that house it was hanging by the door on one hinge the windows were broken out the yard was grown up with weeds and nettles the door was sagging. What had once been a beautiful home was now just a piece of trash. And sometimes people let their lives get into that condition. In Proverbs 24 and verse 30, So I went by the field of the slothful, that's the lazy man, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles and covered the face thereof. And the stone wall was broken down. Then I looked and saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy walk as an armed man. The fourth thing that hinders is discontent. Naomi was a beautiful woman, married to a good husband. She had two sons, Malan and Chilio. And she lived in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. And when the famine came upon Bethlehem, she said to her husband, let's move down to Moab. There is food in Moab. He said, but dear, the Moabites are not Christians. They're not believers. We can't go live among those Moabite tribes. They're heathen. Oh, she said, we must get out of the house of bread and go down to Moab. And she nagged at him and got after him about it so long that finally he said, all right, I'll go. And 
and the family moved to Moab. And there in Moab, her husband Elimelech died. And her two sons, Malan and Chilion, died. And chastened and weary, she turned her footsteps back home. And when she entered home, this beautiful woman whose hair was now streaked with gray, her eyes were dim, the lines of suffering were etched in her face, and the people gathered around her. Her name was Mera. It means bitter. And they gathered around her and they said, Who art thou? She said, I am Mara. For the Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. Chastening is the way God recommends our loss of appetite for Him. Then self-sufficiency. This thing of thinking that we are just a notch or two above everybody else. Or that we can do it on our way. Frank Sinatra used to sing a song. The title of it was, I Did It My Way. Well, if he referred that to salvation, he went to hell. Because you can't do it your way. You've got to receive it God's way. And there was a group of people in a church just like that. Self-sufficient, wealthy. They didn't think they needed anything. They were called the church of Laodicea. And the Lord wrote to that church and said to them, Because thou sayest I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness not appear. There are things that will satisfy the spiritual act. Hunger. The Word of God. Jeremiah said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were the rejoicing of my heart. The Apostle Peter wrote, Desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. For He satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. In John 6, 33, the showbread in the tabernacle was a type of Christ, the bread of life. And John wrote in John chapter 6, For the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The third point is knowing who your righteousness is. Not what your righteousness is, but who your righteousness is. Jeremiah 23 and verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called 
the Lord our righteousness. Who is your righteousness? The Lord your righteousness. Go with me at the cross. There at the bottom of the cross where the Son of God hangs in ignominy and shame stands a rugged old time warrior of Roman Empire, a soldier, hard, rough, uncaring. And he watched Jesus die. And in Luke 23, 47, this hardened centurion, the Bible says, when the centurion saw when he saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. A righteous man. When he saw how Jesus lived and died, he said, this is a righteous man. He, when Jesus hung on the cross, he did not retaliate. He forgave his enemies. He exhibited the meekness of the third beatitude. He exhibited the mercy of the fifth beatitude. He exhibited the pure in heart of the sixth beatitude. And he endured the persecution for righteousness sake of the eighth beatitude. He exhibited righteousness on the cross. But if you were to keep all of those Beatitudes, they would not save you. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that is the gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. So I come back to my text. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled there's the promise if you're hungry if you're thirsty you have the promise of the Savior you will be filled and in case I forget to mention it do you know that all of these eight Beatitudes are a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He lived what he taught. And in John 4, he said, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me the drink. Now he's talking to the woman at the well. Thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 7, 37, in that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly, his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. There was a poor home where a poor widow was taking care of three children. And she would bring a glass of milk to the three children and she would mark three marks on the glass. And she said, 
Now, Johnny, you can drink down to here. And Mary, you can drink down to here. And Sammy, you can drink down to there. And that's all they could do. The three had to share a glass of milk. The little boy, on his way to school, stepped out in the street and was hit by a car. They rushed him to the hospital. And as they were helping him to recuperate, one day the nurse walked into his room with a tall glass of cold milk and handed it to the little boy. And he looked at the glass of milk and he said to the nurse, how deep can I drink? Remember, he's home. And she said, you can drink all you want. And he drank every drop of it. And God is saying, if you're thirsty, you can drink all you want. Let's stand together and be dismissed in prayer. Brother Brown, would you?